Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am indeed David Weir. Uh, yeah, I'm from the University of Helsinki, and it's my great pleasure this evening to take you way back in time, as, as was just said, uh, to, well, when the universe was about the size of your thumb, uh, about one centimeter cubed, or if you prefer, about the size of a uh, Scotch bonnet chili. Uh, I couldn't say if the early universe was hotter or the chili was hotter. Uh, I know which one I prefer. Uh, it's definitely the early universe. Uh, it's too hot for me. Uh, and then, after a while, the universe expanded and went through what uh, I would call the uh, bird's eye chili phase. And then eventually we ended up with present day's uh, green bell pepper phase, which is pleasant to look at, pleasant to eat, and also pleasant to stir fry. Uh, so, you know, I'm by the, my focus of my research is, is definitely on the Scotch bonnets uh, and, and how they got that way. Uh, now, at that time in the history of the universe, the Higgs boson was turning on, it was starting to do its thing. Uh, and this, that, that makes it very interesting and a very important time in the history of the universe because that's, uh, before that, uh, all this matter uh, didn't matter. Uh, and it was uh, only after that that things started to have mass. Uh, and a good analogy for this, uh, which I will show you here, is imagine uh, after the recent presidential elections, a room full of uh, social democrats thinking about the uh, future of their party, uh, and Tarja Halonen walks in, and they all want to see here, they're all very excited, uh, and you know, she, they wanted to discuss policies for going forwards and, and how to, how to uh, reinvigorate their party. And she gets very stressed and frustrated, and she slows down, and she has difficulty getting out of the room. Well, uh, you can imagine that Tarja Hallen, in this case, is kind of like the, the Higgs boson. It, uh, uh, the, the question that I'm trying to ask is not so much uh, how Tarja Hallen works, but in other words, how Tarja Hallen got that way. Uh, and, in, in order to do that, I do very big simulations of uh, expanding uh, copies of Tarja Halonen, uh, like this, uh, and I watch them collide into each other. Uh, and this is more or less what's happening in your uh, finger-sized universe at the, you know, about one picosecond after the Big Bang. After these bubbles have collided, uh, watch it again, after the bubbles have collided, uh, they make uh, these kind of green... Uh, very strong areas of like traveling waves to the box. These are sound waves. They're sound waves in this hot, spicy uh, early universe. And uh, those sound waves are actually very strong sources also in turn of gravitational waves, uh, which is uh, the focus of my research and what I'm going to tell you a bit about today. Uh, but before we get to listening to the sound of these gravitational waves, I want to take you uh, forward to uh, what we know about gravitational waves already. Uh, so this, I love showing this particular visualization. Uh, it looks faintly uh, biological in nature. Maybe it's something which sort of an artificial kidney or something. Uh, but don't be unnerved. It's not. It's, uh, it, it's more or less, if you imagine the lights uh, in shining on me and then reflecting on my ugly uh, face and then uh, reflecting off into the audience, uh, the, the, there's electromagnetic waves you know, wobbling their way towards me and then bouncing off my face towards you. The way that gravitational waves work is more or less the same, but instead of uh, being you know, magnetic and electric fields, it's actually space-time itself, which is squeezing and stretching, squeezing and stretching all its way to me. Uh, or indeed, if there were some of that matter in the way, then that would squeeze and stretch as well. Uh, so that's how we, we, we can see gravitational waves, is if we have something which is sensitive to the squeezing and the stretching. Uh, I'm going to turn this off now because it's a bit disturbing. Uh, the first, way to, uh, the first way that people did that was, uh, well, tried to do it, was uh, in the 1970s and 1960s, when everything was black and white, uh, and the only people who were allowed to work in science were uh, white men wearing pocket protectors and short sleeve shirts like this. Uh, and uh, this thing here was meant to detect gravitational waves. It was a big, basically, tin can, uh, and it wasn't very successful because it wasn't very sensitive. Uh, so we had to move forward, and I'm sure you've all heard of uh, the amazing success. I think it's the most exciting thing that's happened in uh, certainly the past decade in physics, and that's the discoveries of gravitational waves from black holes and neutron stars merging uh, at LIGO, uh, which is, looks like that. Uh, no, I, I actually mean this one. Uh, LIGO is a very, very big project. Uh, it's two big uh, detectors. One of them is in uh, Northwest America, and one is in South America. And us Europeans have uh, chosen a beautiful location for our, our contribution to it, which is called Virgo, which is in beautiful Tuscany. 
Uh, and the way these things work is that you bounce lasers up and down these huge three, four kilometer long arms. Uh, and you see if there's some squeezing and stretching going on, then one arm will be shorter than the other for a little while. And then you get a signal. Uh, now, in, if you are already uh, you know, mad about these things and you, you're entering into the gravitational wave tourism market already, may I recommend Tuscany for your next trip? Uh, the bad news is that the Hanford site, on which the top detector you can see here is located, is actually the largest uh, nuclear waste repository in North America. So it's not a very good uh, destination. Whereas the Louisiana detector, uh, which is the one at the bottom left here, that's, you're going to be sharing the swamp around it with crocodiles. So really uh, make Tuscany your next uh, destination if you're, if you're looking at this. And for those of you who are don't, don't fancy the, the package holiday, this is also available on Google Street View. You can uh, explore the... The, 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 uh, the detector from there. Uh, okay, but this is the this is the cool result, and this, which I think is there's two really exciting things. Now I have the great pleasure of being able to tell you about both of them in in just ten minutes. One is that we've, for example, now seen uh, with the most recent observations from LIGO and Virgo, uh, two neutron stars merging. Uh, this is not my visualization, but I think it's very cool, uh, and. As a result of that, we now know where all the elements heavier than helium come from in the universe. Uh, that's really important. The other cool thing I've told you about, of course, is the Higgs boson. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about how, how, we, how we got that uh, there. And basically, I wanted to ask you about how the uh, Higgs boson, uh, or Ortaria Hallinan, if you prefer, got turned on. Uh, and and uh, I'm going to use that with, uh, with what's called Liza or Lisa. Uh, and you can see that Peter doesn't look very turned on here. But all the same. Uh, we, I'm, going to use, uh, I'm going to tell you about how we're going to use uh, Lisa uh, to, to, to see that. Uh, and Lisa, although I'm looking for sounds of the early universe, uh, in order to see, hear those sounds, I need to go to the quietest place in space, as, as we are calling it. And that's three satellites, which will launch uh, in a few years' time. Uh, and they'll be in a triangle. And there'll be a laser between each of the three satellites. Uh, it's going to be very big. It's going to be so big. Uh, <laughs> It's going to be over three million kilometers in size, and it's the biggest thing. It's just the biggest thing. Um, it's going to be huge. Uh, and <laughs> fake waves, fake waves. Uh, so the three, the three satellites will be, they're, they're going to be, the space between uh, the Earth and the Moon is about uh, three million, 300 million kilometers, sorry, 300,000 kilometers. These are going to be three million kilometers apart, so about 10 times as big as that. And in fact, that's about an eighth of the way to the sun. So this is a, you know, it really is a very large, large thing. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's certainly bigger than, bigger than Trump, bigger than me, bigger than anything else. Uh, so that will launch in 2034. I guarantee it. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a blast. Uh, and uh, so is this. So thank you very much. Any plans for your next summer holiday? Where are you going to travel next? <laughs> I'm probably going to go to Seattle this year, so I'll probably pay a visit to Hanford. If I come back green and spotty, then uh, stay away. <laughs> so any questions from the audience? Please, can someone pass the mic? We have a mic. Why is it the quietest place in space? What so makes the, it quiet? Yeah. So why is it the quietest place in space? Well. These satellites, that's a very good question, and it's, the short answer is it's because uh, it's just a cool thing which sounds like it rhymes. And, uh, but the long answer is that these satellites are, uh, there's the laser inside them, and they're, they're firing a laser off to the other satellite, which is halfway across the solar system. Uh, and, but the, kind of the gubbins of the satellite, the stuff which goes around it, like the thrusters and all this stuff, uh, it has to be basically moving itself around the laser at all times, so the laser itself is in free fall and is completely isolated. So uh, with the recent results from LISA Pathfinder, which is a test bed for, for LISA, uh, we got the separation between the satellite kind of body and the thing inside it uh, down to uh, the most, it's basically the thing which is most isolated from its surroundings we have ever made as humans. And we did it uh, not only like that, we don't only really did that, but we also did it in space and you know, millions of kilometers away from the Earth. So that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that's why it's quite this place in space. Some more questions? How does it sound like? Uh, have you run any simula simulation? How, how does it sound? Or can you play us or sing us? How, how does oh. it sound like? <laughs> it's a, I, I'll do an impression of it, which is... 
Uh, it's not. <laughs> It's not that exciting. I, I, I regret to say it's not very exciting, but it does sound like indigestion. Uh, and it looks like, it sounds like that, that movie of the gravitational waves I showed you. Okay, so let's thank David one more. Thank you.